So interestingly, well, we we look very similar. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's very hard. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, we yeah we have the baldness theme. And I, I was I was reading through the uh, you know the diary and uh, again, and I, I was finding all these references to to haircuts as well, which was very. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, funny I, in, in relation to access thinking and um, you know uh, neat versus shaggy, masculine versus feminine, and uh, you make a very interesting remark where you talk about uh, you know access thinking as an aim for a continuum of possibilities between two uh, between two extremes, and then um, what about haircuts? Um, <laughs> Becomes the question, and then, um, and then the same, the same, uh, which is going to, you know, bring us to hopefully to what we're going to talk about. Um, what we what wants to talk about was the you had you make a remark about empathy, <clears throat> and you say that um, uh, the, the usual view is that human culture begins with language. We're you know we're linguistic animals, and that's that is that's that's a view. Um, but you say, and there's lots of evidence to back this up, that it starts elsewhere, perhaps starts with other things like uh, visual things, musical things, but it mm -hmm. starts with empathy. Um, and you think it starts with empathy, which is beyond language, but a precondition for it, you say, back then. Yes. I just wonder. And I guess yes, what so, we're, yeah. So what I, what I would say is that it, it really begins with, what they call theory of mind, which is which is the ability to understand what might be in another person's mind, and to understand that that might be different from what's in your mind. I mean, this is essential for humans. That this is why we're able to communicate with each other because we we know that we don't have exactly the same picture in mind. So I can talk to the picture that I know you have, mm -hmm. which, and I can slightly modify the way I describe it. Um, so that I can communicate with that picture. And this is, of course, why humans can lie. Um, humans can lie because they they know how to create a false picture in somebody else's head. And mm -hmm. until recently, it, it was thought that only humans would because it requires this thing called theory of mind. But um, now it turns out that some animals are capable of deceit like certain birds are capable of misleading other birds about where they've hidden food, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, certain chimps can do that as well, so, certain of our primate cousins. So it it isn't unique to humans, but it's very, very much more highly developed in us, I think, this this ability to inhabit somebody else's mind. And we can even make quite quite complicated ideas like, Mary knew that David was angry with Joan because she had been unkind to Jill. So mm -hmm. there we're talking, we're sort of inhabiting a chain of four minds in a row. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this seems to be uniquely human, I think. And so the, the question is, how did we get to be like that? And are we getting better at being like that? You know, is 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 it possible that that's one of those a, a sort of human mental skill that that is evolving over time? Um, I don't know. I mean, there's you know, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of debate, say, in the history of philosophy about you know where um, you see where where morality originates and uh you know there are certain people that think it's reason and can't mm -hmm. and there are others uh usually called moral sense theorists who say believe begins something else with a feeling like sympathy mm -hmm. or empathy or uh, mm -hmm. or benevolence and um i i um i prefer <laughs> that view of things uh, but the problem is how you generalize that and how you deal with situations where there's an obvious lack of empathy or where people where that empathy will be used to get deceive or lie 
or manipulate yes. or deceive and that's that you know once we once we introduce you know that the, the the world of emotions into into things like morality and politics which is you know, obviously there then then the capacity for deceit is obviously magnified does that mm -hmm. change in human behavior um I don't know. I mean, I, I, I suppose I'm not a huge um, fan of progress in a way. I mean, it's a it, it's a nice idea. You know, it looks good on the Brazilian flag, and uh, but I think that might be the best place for it. I think there are certain mm -hmm. capacities which human beings have in in groups, uh, which are which 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 are linguistic, but they're also visual, symbolic, uh, musical, uh, collective, and they. Um, yeah. I guess, and that, so you know, the, the question which I guess you wanted to, you, you suggested, and I think is a is a good question. You know, why do we do art? <laughs> mm -hmm. That issue, of why why do we do art? I mean, there are different ways of of, of tackling that. I mean, it's, um, I mean, I, I, um, I don't know what you what you. Well, I've got a sense of what your what your view is, but I'd like I'd like to know what your your view of that is. I mean, I've got maybe a, an idiosyncratic response to it, which is more like well, to, yeah. But go on, you go first. Okay. Well, it's it's quite a long story, so um, I won't try to tell the whole of my thoughts about that question. It it is to me the most interesting question of all. For instance, to make it very specific, why do we like music? Why would we be interested in one set of noises rather than another? And not only interested in, sometimes completely obsessed by, moved to tears by, moved to rage by this set of noises made by a group of instruments rather than another set of noises made by the same group of instruments. Um, we We obviously feel very strongly about this thing that isn't Figurative, it's not telling us a story in any obvious novelistic way. Um, what what is actually happening to us? So this is this is actually why I got interested in haircuts because oh, I wanted yeah. I, I want to be able to talk about those sorts of aesthetic choices we make, but not in relation to things like paintings or symphonies because we don't all share those. Mm -hmm. But nearly everybody shares a feeling about their haircut. So, so I want to look at the haircut as a sort of aesthetic, a set of aesthetic decisions that everybody makes, um, just like they make decisions about what kind of music they like. Mm -hmm. And to, and this is where this axis thing came up, yeah. because when you make a haircut decision. For instance, one axis in haircut decision might be masculine, feminine. You can have a totally feminine haircut, um, like a, a beehive, for instance. That that's mm -hmm. traditionally a totally feminine haircut. Or you can have a totally masculine one, like a sort of like what we've got, <laughs> buzz cuts. <laughs> um, um, and of course, playing with those gender positions and everything in between those two. Is interesting, you know that that's a long continuum, and there's lots of places in between. So somehow, when when we're making a choice about our haircuts, we're making choices about where we want to be. For instance, on the masculine-feminine axis. Mm -hmm. For instance, on the primitive, futuristic axis. On the natural, contrived axis. On on a whole set of axes like that. And I think, I mean, I'm, cut, I'm making a very short circuit in this argument here, but I think that any artwork is really, as well as lots of other things, it's really a package of these propositions, these axes, mm -hmm. and, it, and it, it has a particular address in that nest of axes. Any artwork is, is a sort of particular place in of those things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we quite unconsciously, most of the time, or subconsciously, make decisions about those things and have strong feelings about them. You know, people say, and they mean it, 
I wouldn't be seen dead in that, referring yeah. to a piece of clothing or a haircut or something. Um, mm -hmm. So the feelings are very strong, and I think they're strong because at some level we know what those things represent. We know what a haircut means. Yeah. If nothing else, it means I'm like one of those kinds of people who has that kind of haircut. Mm -hmm. And you might not even be able to articulate or to take apart what that package of things is. But nonetheless, it has some meaning to you. So so that's that's a first answer to that question um, of why do we get so obsessed with artworks? Um, so. I think you know you you can apply the same kind of argument to clothes or to earrings or to songs or to sculptures or to anything else you can you can always say what set of axes are being explored here yeah it's probably not the funnest way to enjoy a piece of work but that's it's a good question to ask well I was I mean because my my mother and uh my mother was a hairdresser and my sister uh, was a hairdresser. And so, you know, I was experimented on <laughs> when I was a young child relentlessly. So, so my baldness was a kind of revenge against <laughs> them. So there could be no haircut because there was no hair. And my mother always held me personally responsible for going bald. She used to say, you know, you have that lovely hair, Simon. You have such lovely hair. What happened to it? And she used to insist it was blonde as well. I've got photographs which show it wasn't blonde, it was brown, but in six years. So it's a, it's a, yeah, so uh, baldness is my revenge. Now, I okay. wanted to, I was a big, no, I was, I was, here's, because we're, we're, we're improvising here, obviously, and um, <laughs> as will be clear to the audience, we're <laughs> improvising. The, the, um, the, and I was, did, I did this, um, my last class for the semester on Tuesday, and um, and I mentioned this just because it was interesting what transpired. That the uh, it's been a class on called pandemic mysticism. It's been an odd class taking these ideas, taking the fact that we've been in these kind of withdrawals, these kind of anchor holds, uh, re re retreated from the world, and living like you know in this kind of monk-like or nun-like state. Mm -hmm. for the last year and what is that and that's thrown up all of these strange emotions right uh yeah. anxiety depression and all of that which have been which have been talked about but one thing that i've so we've, we've been looking at some of these texts for this semester but the last class i wanted to do it on music and uh because the sense that i've had over the the uh, over covid is that the i mean what you say about haircuts and you know other other types of things, earrings and, and perfume is, is true, but there's a particular kind of intensity that people have experienced around music in the last, in general, over the last year. And this class went on for nearly three hours and students just picked a piece of music that they, that meant a lot to them and why it meant a lot to them. And the range was was startling. But the, what, what, what bound them together was just the, the sense of, uh, of what this meant, how deeply this was felt without that necessarily being able to be articulated. But there is something, I think, certainly for me, about music, which is able to carry um, a kind of intensity, which other forms of music, other forms of art, because they can do that. But for me, less pointedly, I guess, because I have less of a vocabulary for articulating, I don't really know what music does to me. I just know that it does it, and um, and then questions of taste and questions of you know become really important, and you know as as, as we all know. But but I just wondered um, whether that made sense to you that the um, there's something characteristic, something in, incredibly intense about the you know the what what do we do with art question in relationship to music in the last period of time and how we might. Yes, well Think about I, I think I think I think the reason I said that question, why do we like music, is because it's so ex an extreme version of that mystery. You can say, why do we like novels? And there's a whole other set of reasons for liking novels, like mm -hmm. the story, the momentum of the story and the fascination of the characters in the story and so on. But 
if you want a purely abstract form of art, music is it. You know, this is music is where painting finally got to in the early 20th century when people like Kandinsky started leaving out the subject, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, the, he, they weren't making paintings of anything, like of a painting of a scene or of a ship or of a nude or something like that. Um, music had been doing that for centuries. You no, know, music never had a subject in that sense. Um, of course, songs do. They're, that's a slightly special case. Then they have a narrative element in them. But but music, despite the efforts of the people who write the text on classical music covers, where they try to say that here Beethoven is um, portraying the bubbling of a mountain stream and all that bollocks, which all of us know is not rem nothing to do with what's actually going on. Um, we have to accept that music is simply about itself, really. It's it's mm -hmm. about the arrangement of things in relation to each other. Um, you know, you have opera where you sort of graft on a narrative as well, but most of us listen to opera in a language we don't understand and have no idea what, what it's about, and it doesn't matter. We, we aren't concerned with that. You don't, you don't need subtitles with music. You know, you don't, mm -hmm. you don't have, to have French music translated for you or Belgian music translated for you. Um, so, so to me, it's a, it makes this question particularly um, pointed because you, you can't point to any of the conventional reasons for, for liking an art form of saying, oh, well, it, it's a good story or those kinds of novelistic reasons that you might um, use with a with some kind of written text. So my my question is, what is happening when you listen to a piece of music? What is happening to you? Mm -hmm. um, again, this is quite a a big subject, but I I think what is happening is that you are agreeing to enter into a world with with a set of internal values and a sort of internal logic to it. Mm -hmm. So um, I say that about an internal logic because the logic of a, you know, a 1928 blues recording, the internal logic of that is quite different from the internal logic of a symphony orchestra playing mm -hmm. a big piece like that. But there is a logic, and as soon as you hear the first few notes, you know the kind of world of listening that you're in. You don't listen to a blues musician and say, where are the oboes? Yeah, Where's right. the harp? Yeah. <laughs> Who's the conductor? You, you know that it's a different set of rules in, the, in each of these worlds. And as soon as you know that, you, you work within the terms of that world. So suddenly, De certain details become very interesting, and they wouldn't be in another musical language. Um, certain things are missing completely. They aren't a subject at all. Um, for instance, to take an example, in most classical music, variety is a big issue. You mm -hmm. know, things go from the loud movement the, to the quiet movement to the bad movement <laughs> um, mm -hmm. to the energetic movement. There's, there's always that kind of motion. But then if you listen to a composer like Steve Reich or, or actually to quite a lot of religious music, there isn't that sort of dynamic. There's a steady yeah. state. Yeah. So, but in each case, when you come to them as a listener, you sort of immediately twig, oh, yes, this is, we're now under these kinds of rules. We're now in this sort of world and I'm going to enjoy being in that world. But the important thing of that, about that for me, is understanding that what you're doing is entering an imaginary world of some kind. Yeah. And then seeing how you feel about it. You know, mm -hmm. suddenly, oh, I love this world. Oh, I don't like this one very much. Um, mm -hmm. We're picking and choosing between worlds. Now, you, you said something in your book that I really, like if I can remember it, uh, um, theater. Theater is the night kitchen of democracy. Is that right? Yeah, I did say that. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 a really nice sentence. I think because it, to me, it it 
captures this thing that I think art does. It gives you a place to try things out. Mm -hmm. Now, again, in novels, that in theater and film, that's very clear how that's done. You invent a scenario, you invent characters who inhabit it, and then you see what happens to them. Yeah. Um, that's a really wonderful thing to do, and it's a way that we understand a lot about the world. But for me, the more difficult question is, are we doing the same thing as that when we look at, say, a Jackson Pollock painting or a, a Steve Reich piece of music or something that doesn't have any narrative content? How are we, is that the same process going on? And so that's the question that I like to ask and I like to think of ways of answering it. But I, I'll let you, <laughs> I'll let you proceed for a little bit. No, no, it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's the, the, the theatre is the night kitchen of democracy is also, you know, it's the, um, because I wrote um, that piece and other pieces. I was living in Athens and um, in 2019 and writing some pieces from there. And there you've got, you know, on one side of the Acropolis, you have, the agora and democracy and the, the the council, the boule and all of those institutions. Then the other side of the Acropolis, the rock, you have the, you know, what was the theatre? And mm -hmm. this described as, uh, you know, people didn't say they were going to the theatre. The Athenians didn't say that. They said they were going to musicate, right? They were going to music, right? This was, this was kind of music, dance. That was what was going on in theatre. And Often what was going on in those two places seems to be completely contradictory. You have a world of, let's say, a, you know, democracy, limited as it was mm -hmm. in Athens. But, you know, they invented it. And theatre, they invented that too. And, and, and contrasting worlds, a world of, you know, kings and uh, a, kind of a mythic world which had gone uh, at the same time as, you know, this other world of democracy which was being stage and the relationship between the two is really hard to figure out the the, the music of it is um, I think is very important and look I wanted to I wanted to also take this in a there's some things I'd like to bring up um, one is idiot glee from mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which I think is, is something we could do with a lot more idiot glee it's it's a very Nice concept, and the way you describe it coming from a conversation with Fripp, I think, on a subway station or something. It, it's, but yeah, the, the, just the, the feeling of being glad to be alive. And I think yeah. music does that. Music makes me glad to be alive all the time. How it does that um, is the issue. I mean, I think the, the, um, the way you described it in terms of entering into worlds, accepting a kind of the logic of what, yes. Um, but I suppose there's also, um, uh, but does that capture the, 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 the pathos of music and the intensity of music and the way we're, we're transported by it? And, you know, and I also feel that, it, you know, um, but let me, Quote something you wrote back at you and see what you think about it now. Obviously, this is this is 25 years ago in the uh, the diary, but I thought it was just a very interesting remark. And you describe it as your most optimistic thought. Um, you say this is my most optimistic thought: the people the people abandon increasingly the increasingly perilous old definitions of identity, such as race, like, and ethnicity, and class, and blood and start thinking of identity as something multiple, shifting, blurred, experimental, and adaptive. I think mm -hmm. the philosophical underpinning for such a change is already sliding into place under the guise of pure entertainment. And that's <laughs> absolutely... <laughs> and it's also that the... And I think that music does something like that, that there is... A, the experience of it is an experience of identity which we seem to be still deeply attached to but as multiple shifting blurred experimental hybrid fluid odd, and we can you know and which means that we can listen to musics from completely different yes. cultures with, with, with a, a deep intensity a shared intensity and 
So in many ways, the the um, I mean, your most you know, your most optimistic thought, but I think the I, I feel that optimism. I think probably probably only in music when I'm when I'm listening to music and talking about music and experiencing music with people, and then you see someone that you've got yeah you know, maybe little in common with, and then you 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 get to talking about music, and then you find these common points of reference and these common yeah. felt intensities, and then and then a world opens up in a different way. So how would you do? You still feel optimistic in that way? Yes, you you said something just when we started out. Actually, you said um, you said something that questioned the idea of progress, and I I generally would agree with you about that. I don't, I'm not um, wedded to the sort of Steven Pinker idea that everything's getting better all the time. Right. Um, and and I have a lot of arguments with my Californian friends about this who. Clearly believe that it is, despite the evidence, um, as far as I can. Think. But but one thing that I do think is different. Um, would in your mind would progress be a proper name for the the generalization of empathy? For instance, yeah, I I think it is significant that you know when that. Big tsunami happened in 2005. Do you remember when yeah. hundreds of thousands of people suffered? That all over the world, people started sending money mm -hmm. to people they would never meet, never mm -hmm. even know who this money was going to. And I thought that was really quite extraordinary. And I saw something of that kind of empathy last year as well. Um, during the worst days of COVID, my daughter is a doctor and I heard many stories from her about this kind of thing, um, and I think that that is quite interesting. That we don't seem to be so chained as we used to be to family or clan or immediate connections. We we have much a much broader set of connections, and I th I'm sure that one of the reasons we we do that is because we share so much art together. Uh -huh. I, I'm art in a very broad sense meaning um you know all sorts of pop culture and foodstuffs and you know i'm not only whenever i use the word art i'm not just talking about high art i'm talking oh, about sure. yeah. everything stylistic that people do um and i'm sure that that makes us capable of starting to believe that all those other people aren't savages you know the way in <laughs> When you ask what does what does the name you know Iglalu Su mean or whatever the name of the ethnic group is, and it turns out that it always means the people. So it used to be the case that everyone thought that they were the people, as it were, the chosen people. This just this little group that I happen to belong to. I mm -hmm. I think people think of, think less and less like that now. Perhaps I'm being optimistic in believing that, but. Um, but I think that there is a sense when we when we enjoy the art of another nation that we are somehow or another people we're somehow connecting at the at a level below language lower than deeper than language. Mm -hmm. um, we might not agree on quite a lot of things if we actually articulated them, but we at least agree that we are both. Of the same hum level of humanity to be able to enjoy this same artifact, mm -hmm. um, something connects us. Uh, I, d I don't know if that's yeah. That that, 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 that I, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I, I'm also the, the, to, to qualify the, the thought about progress. It's not that my problem with progress is that it you know it induces forgetfulness, or it can induce the idea of history as a kind of yeah. a linear history is yes. a line. It's going. It's an arrow. It's going this way, and it's not. Yeah, it is a series of loops. It's a kind of almost like a, a strange piece of generative music. It's a kind of. It's a kind of. It's a kind of looping back and forth, and things are. Things are remembered, and things are forgotten, and you know what? And then it can be quite saddening in a way that you know, for example. Um, 
in relation to the pandemic and a question you know we were talking about earlier on was you know has the pandemic you know what is the point of art and philosophy in a world falling apart has covid taught us anything and um we you know we think well we grew up in cultures of that were seem to be committed to remembering things like the first world war there was a monument yeah. in every village and everything but we forgot the spanish flu hmm? we forgot that we you know we remember the first world war and it's terrible and it did but but it did these extraordinary things it led to these extraordinary innovations in in art and in in philosophy it led to Wittgenstein's mm -hmm. Tractatus, uh, Rosenzweig, Freud, Heidegger, all these things, and, and in poetry, Eliot's Wasteland, and whatever, all these amazing things. But we forgot the flu, and mm -hmm. and so in a sense, the, the the last year for me has been also about not so much progress, but in the sense that but there's a kind of looping back to something archaic yes. in us, and yes. and now we think, oh, of course. Yeah, human society is defined by plague, right? That that's 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 what that's what happens in human societies. They they they're affected by pestilence, and mm -hmm. um, and that's happened to us. And in that remembering of that, something kind of elemental is is awoken in us, which I don't think we've figured out yet. There's 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 fear and anxiety and and sadness. There's that. There's also a a, a real wish for pleasure. But for diversion, for for, for distraction, mm -hmm. and um, and it's also it's um, you know there the, the, there is one hopes you know a creative possibility in in this right if uh, if the the plague in its terrible effects can also shake things up in a way that allows for new new kinds of experimentation to 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 appear. And um, do you know I that happens? <laughs> I don't know. Do you know that there's a book by a writer called Walter Scheidel, who's a um, I don't know what nationality he is. He teaches in California. Um, the book is called um, The Great Leveler, yeah. and it's he's a historian, sort of an economic historian, and he goes through five thousand years of history showing that the only thing that tames inequality is war or pestilence. <laughs> so, um, you know, whenever there's, whenever there's a real breakdown of society because of war or pestilence, for a little while, things improve afterwards. Things, mm -hmm. things get more equal. For instance, the famous case is the Black Death, where for the first time ever, feudal serfs, workers, had the chance to uh, argue about their wages because they were in demand. There weren't yeah. enough of them. So many yeah. had died in the plague. And he, it's a quite depressing book because the sort of message of it is that things only ever get better after they've been really bad. Mm -hmm. So things have to get really bad to improve. And I, I sort of wonder if we're on that trajectory now. We're seeing the most extraordinary inequality that has ever existed in world history. Mm -hmm. with people so unthinkably rich and lots and lots of people so unthinkably poor. And we're seeing, you know, a climate crisis. We're seeing democracy crumbling in many ways. We're right at the edge of a big collapse, it seems. And the only possible good news is that maybe after that, there'll be a, a revival. Some, there'll be a new, a new beginning, you know like there was after the plague and like there was actually after the Second World War. You know, you had that 35, 40 year stretch after the Second World War before neoliberalism, Thatcher, Thatcher and Reagan and so on. You had a period where you had some kind of working and effective socialism, the yeah. National Health Service. What an incredible idea. Yeah, yeah. And it was built and it worked. Yeah. And and it enabled someone like you and then someone like me to get educated, to um, yeah. to, to move from one set of social circumstances to another uh, without having to pay huge amounts. And, and it was, yeah, and it's and it's and and it's gone. Yeah, I, I yeah. hope the 
I mean, the, the question of, I mean, I was teaching um, Julian of Norwich uh, a few weeks ago, and um, I teaching her book Showings, which is the first book in you know in English by a woman that we we know it we know for sure is by a woman, which uh, and it's it's extraordinary that it's not it's not read more, but there was also and there she is in her anchor hold in her kind of lockdown for 30 years in St. Julian's Church in, in Norwich and outside is Black Death, which I think in, in the city of Norwich, which was the second biggest city in England at the time, uh, I think a third of the population died mm -hmm. and proved common across the whole of the whole of Britain. That led to a labour shortage, that led to the Peasants' Revolt, that led yes. to the biggest, you know, insurgency and uh, insurrectional status which Britain, uh, which, which England experienced until the, uh, you know, the, the 17th century. And I mean, you know, you, um, the, the, it, to that extent, the, the conditions of, conditions are propitious maybe, uh, you know, or these, and I think all these, they're possibly propitious. And the, I mean, the, what, um, what for me philosophy can, you know, do is that I mean, philosophy is, um, you know, is, is, is thinking that takes place in, in solitude and in conditions of pestilence a lot of the time. You've got, mm -hmm. you know, philosophers locked up like Boethius and, uh, and, and Socrates and, and many others. And in a sense, it can, that, that feeling of withdrawal, um, and, uh, reflection, the fact that we've been through this philosophical moment over the last year has thrown up all sorts of, um, all sorts of feelings. And there's a tendency, there's, there's a strong desire to kind of manically push those aside and go back to normal and have a good time yeah. and have a holiday. And that's fine. But, you know, you really wonder whether, uh, this could be, this could, this could develop in more interesting ways. I mean, in the, the preface to the, um, the new, the, the, the new edition of the diary, you ask a question, which uh, I thought was, you know, you, you say even, even, even an empire cannot change biological reality. And I wonder whether it will make any difference to how we view the role of leadership in the future, not the macho braggarts, not the we make our own reality brigade, but the people who have the humility to listen to science and the humanity to care enough to act on it. Mm -hmm. and I, as well said, and I guess I um, we'll find out. As Philip Lard <laughs> would say, we will find out. I mean, unfortunately, I think we are finding out already, and it's kind of depressing. I was I was at a meeting. I'm on the board of a public institution here in England, and at the beginning of the meeting, the chairman said, "Well, we hadn't met for a while. Would everybody like to sort of give?" their assessment about where we are after this period of COVID and how, you know, how are things doing? And one by one, people were saying, oh, it's great. People are spending money like nobody's business. Everything's back up. Property prices are going up. Da, 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 da. And I was getting more and more depressed. I was thinking, is that what it's about then? We're just going to get back on the train and mm -hmm. act as if nothing happened. It seemed to me like the most extraordinary failure of, of, an opportunity actually you know we had an opportunity and i i really sincerely hope that people first of all start remembering a few things about how last year when we were suddenly made aware of who the essential workers were yeah and they weren't people running hedge funds they mm -hmm. were people doing shitty bad paid jobs mm -hmm. that we hadn't paid any attention to for a very long time and suddenly we're hanging on there you know, ad admiring them and applauding them every Thursday night and so on, uh, which we should have been doing perhaps for all the previous Thursday nights as well. So there was that, there's that. And the other thing that came up was I remember so well last year how so many people were saying, do you know what, I haven't been into a shop for two months and I don't mind. I haven't mm -hmm. bought any new shoes or clothes and actually I'm quite enjoying this. I'm quite enjoying wearing the same things every day, mm -hmm. um, and I, I actually like being with my family. I haven't had a chance to do this. Right. I, 
I just hope that people don't forget that that we were sort of all reborn in a funny way last. Um, yeah. Have you found it? Wasn't it all... Have you found we more, more narrowly with 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 music in the sense in which um um then what's been going because in a sense the when I was you know going rereading the diary and I've been thinking about things and um thinking about the um well a couple of things really there's the there's the idea in a sense of you know the, the of say generative music which you you know pioneered uh and you know back in that book I think you talk about there's the there are three options there's live music recorded music and generative music and you know mm. and and it also happens now with streaming that you know you let the algorithm do its magic and a whole yeah. evening you have to make a choice and then and, and you and then the weird things you find yourself listening oh, this is pretty good you know mm -hmm. those, those, work. they know my taste so well and I, I don't know what you, you 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 think about that and also that the there's another concept which is just good to remember that you introduced which i think is um it, it just keeps getting lost because we just focus on individuals. We focus on, you know, heroic, heroic yeah. figures, great figures, stars, the people we admire, which is maybe that's just human weakness. But, you know, you you say that you're against what you call the, the big man idea of history. Mm -hmm. and you talk about uh, not genius, but seniors. Genius. And I think that's um, that's a very interesting concept because it you know if you look at the periods of extraordinary creativity in popular music in the last 70 years indeed they've all been seniors moments they've all been moments yeah. where certain concatenations of individuals have found themselves in a place or in a number of places and they've they've found something together and this is how you know punk happened and how you know we, we know we, you know the story and i wonder what the conditions for seniors are now or yeah been. that really puzzles me and then yeah well i th i think one of the interesting things about last year certainly for me and for many people i know is is the possibility of having conversations like this i yeah. mean we're we're geographically three thousand miles apart we're at different times of the day and to have arranged this conversation three years ago would have been incredibly complicated hotels planes you know yeah. all the apparatus um, well now we can have conversations like this three or four times a day where we're talking to people in Beijing in Sydney or wherever so that to me is very interesting that I've seen so many um, sort of thought coalitions come into existence in the last year of people being able to have complicated and interesting conversations repeatedly you know, so bringing people together once is difficult enough with all the planes and the hotel rooms. But for them to be able to do it every week, you know, I have one discussion group that I'm part of. It's just four of us, but mm -hmm. we're in three different continents. Every week and have a chat. Um, this is such an incredible luxury. Um, mm -hmm. When could you ever do that in history before? So. You know, you have that great seniors of ancient Greece. That was Athens mm -hmm. was was one of the great seniors, by the way, for the benefit of people who don't know. Is whereas genius is sort of the intelligence of a of an individual. Seniors is the intelligence of a whole team, a whole group of people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're seeing much more of that now than we ever did before. For instance, one reason for that is because job definitions have become so blurry. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of people have lots of different jobs. You know, they aren't really one thing. They they do a bit of this and a bit of that, and they make their own melange of these things. Um, I see that more and more with young people because it's so hard to get a job. So somebody will do a day on this place and a couple of hours over there. They're always on the phone available for that job. Um, this, this is, again, Sort of a a hunter gatherer style of of being occupied 
you know, as opposed to the agricultural style where you have your field and you go and tend it every day and look after it carefully. What I see people doing more now is um, moving around, finding things, putting them together, moving on, doing something else. It's it's so much less focused. Mm -hmm. Not all of course. not all jobs are like that by any means, but for many people that's become, you know, I know young people who have four jobs. And right. each one of them would have been your job a few years ago. Now right. it's just one of the things they do. Particularly yeah. in the arts, I think that's true. So we've all become um, pastoralists in a way. Yes, that's right. I think so. I'm just wondering, there's all lots of questions here. Do you think we should? Yeah, we should. Have a look. Um, okay, here's, I'll start at the end. An okay. anonymous question. Would you agree that music generally is comprised of notes which are specific frequencies of sound that resonate in the human ear? We're sympathetic to these sounds. The rest of it, how we articulate sympathy with these sounds, is interpretation which requires language. Um, I I don't know about it requiring language. I mean, I think one of the part of the magic of, of music is that we don't have to be able to articulate it, um, how we feel about it. In fact, it's probably the, the experiences that we feel most strongly about are the ones that we can't articulate about, yeah. where something has happened to us beyond language. Something, things that happen beyond language feel very deep. They feel like they come from a very deep place in us. Um, and sometimes the articulating of them uh, slightly confines them, actually. So I, I, the implication of your question is that language is, is an essential part of the mix. You're probably saying, no, I didn't mean that. Well, that's what I understood. <laughs> Um, no, I think it's with me. It's it's very much the the you know because I you know spent I write books and I was you know taught to think in writing and I've developed that over the years and I in a sense I I can say well that's very nice but that's not really what I care about what I care about is music that, that's what I care about which I can't talk about um, I can talk I I can I can talk about it in rough approximative ways, but I can't express uh, why certain things matter so intensely to me. You know, when Nietzsche says, you know, without, you know, without music, life would be an error. Just think well, that's, <laughs> that, that, that's right. Yeah, it would be an error. And, and, but there are people who don't feel as strongly about music and I can't help judging them at that point in some horrible way. Yeah, so it's a kind of, um, yeah. I, I knew somebody actually, very nice person. I, I enjoyed the company of very much. And he once said to me, I, I just don't like music. Right. That and I, I said, well, any, any music? He said, yeah, I just don't like it. I don't like listening to it. And that seemed to me so unusual. It made me realize how how much I assume that music is a key part of everyone's life. It, it wasn't mm -hmm. in, in his case. Can I, can I read another question here? Yeah, questions too. Um, yeah, yeah. Go on. Um, this is Jamie Denham asking on art and morality. Doesn't a concentration camp also work by a system of internal rules? associations isn't music and abstract art aiming for the thing in itself by definition amoral the thing in itself is one of those philosophical phrases and the, the ding and sich or, mm -hmm. or however they say it in german um, yeah. um is it is it amoral that's a very difficult question um is it possible for anything that humans do to be amoral? Um, don't, isn't our morality informing everything that we do? What, what would be a philosophical view of that? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult 
question. I mean, it's, you know, because you, actually in the diary, you say, you know, it doesn't a concentration camp also work by system internal rules and associate? Yes, it does. And, um, you know, uh, and I, my view is informed by, I was very pleased to see Raoul Peck exterminate all the brute, very brutal documentary series, but um, it, it picks up from the work of Sven Linkvist, who's someone I think is a very, very important thinker, who shows that basically the, what, the continuity of Western civilization is a, is, a, is a continuity of extermination, and we just get better and better at killing people. And, and, the, and the concentration camp is a, is, a, is a technology for that, and it mm -hmm. begins in, you know, in, in Cuba, South Africa, and then it's extended by the Germans into uh, into Poland, and that's and does that mean there can be no poetry after Auschwitz? No, that's where you know Adorno is wrong. No, mm -hmm. it's not a precondition for it, but it doesn't disqualify it. And it's yeah. um, and then the question of whether it's um, isn't music a thing in itself and by definition immoral? I don't know. I mean, it depends. It really depends on what. You know what metaphysics you're coming to there's, there's there's a view which you can find in say you know, one of my favorite poets is wallace stevens one of his last mm. poems called not ideas about the thing but the thing itself and his thesis roughly is that poetry is ideas about the thing it's not the thing itself and so he says there's a sun there's a yeah. there's a pond and and that's the thing in itself and i can't say that that's one view another view Another writer who I, I'm very uh, uh, much admire, so with Annie Dillard, an American writer, yeah. um, uh, she takes the view, that, which is in a sense that no, in um, the, the thing in itself, in 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 an artwork, the thing in itself is alive. It becomes, you know, you have to 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 to, to an artistic world has to be in a sense animistic. Uh, we mm -hmm. have. To, we have to inhabit an animistic world where these are things in themselves and they have agency and they're connected to us. And I think if we ask us, if we ask us of the, the question about music, well, coldly, we, we could divide it up into different boxes. But when we're experiencing a piece of music, then it's not, it, it's alive. So therefore, and it's also not amoral. It's, you know, it, it's, it's part of our, moral view that not in a kind of a moralistic view but it's just kind of the sets of habits and practices and uh, and ways of thinking that constitute being in a world in my humble opinion yeah <laughs> well not that humble that's <laughs> a good not opinion um, w one thing i wanted to ask you one of the interesting things about art over the last 50 years or so is that very often it's been complete outsiders who've revolutionized areas of artistic behavior. So they aren't necessarily people who came up through the academy and studied this and that and so on and got their degrees and so on. Um, I mean, you see it in pop music in particular, where a band like the Velvet Underground, who had a, a drummer who'd never played drums before and, you know, who, who on paper should not have been a successful band. Um, they were a great band, one of the great innovating bands. So mm -hmm. in in art, I think we're quite used to the idea now that sometimes it's complete outsiders who will change the direction of the art form. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll do something that nobody within the so-called academy would have done. But is the same thing true in philosophy? Who makes philosophy now? I mean, of course, I know there are professional philosophers who do it, but are there outsiders, people who come up with an idea which makes you think, wow, that's a thought that I hadn't ever had before. That's a way of thinking. Um, I don't know wh who those people might be, but. I think that the, I think what's happened is that, um, and if I, you know, if I uh, talk about my time as a student, it makes to, to you know, the students I have now, it sounds very, very odd because, I mean, the people I was I was taught by were were weirdos. They were they were mm -hmm. weirdos. They were freaks. They were odd. 
they were they did odd things uh they drank a lot and uh and they found a they found a refuge in universities universities university of essex where i was at in colchester was a kind of a camp where there was the, these things things could be thought universities have become increasingly bureaucratized boring yeah um, and art schools too yeah and arts yeah and arts, art schools had that that too so someone like, i think you mentioned this in the book but someone like goldsmiths at a certain point had that kind of genius energy it had nothing yeah. was going on there there were and it was yeah. something between teachers, students, the uh, the pop scene, the Bond Street galleries, and it suddenly it, th things emerged. And yeah. in in philosophy, it was possible to do that kind of work um, in academic structures. It's it's harder to do that. One is not invited to do that. So someone that you you mention who is a kind of uh, I wouldn't say hero, but someone I I admire. Although I criticised, I, I, I admired more and more since he left us. Is like Richard Rorty. Uh, oh Rorty, gosh, my yeah. favourite philosopher. <laughs> he was, Rorty was, I mean, Rorty was, you know, an academic, you know, at, in philosophy at Princeton, you know, in a serious proper. But he, he left. He had to. Um, he, and, he ended up, you know, in, as a professor of humanities, and he found that. Philosophy was philosophy is very much structured as a guild, a kind of medieval guild with masters and apprentices, and that can enable a certain kind of training at certain moments, but it can also be stultifying and dull. And uh, mm -hmm. I think more in the stultifying and, 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 and dull moment now. There's still good people out there, but academia has become a place where it's just harder and harder to say really interesting things for reasons yes. that often quite bewilder me well i have to say that in rorty was a very big figure in my life he was the first philosopher that contemporary philosopher that i read where i thought this is talking about something that i want to know about i tried to read you know carnap and all of those analytical philosophers and i just thought I don't even. I'm not interested in what this is about. Actually, I, mm -hmm. I don't. Even, I don't even care what they think about this. Whereas mm -hmm. when Rorty came along, something different happened. But the people now that I'm finding are sort of my philosophers. The people I'm reading for those kinds of thoughts are, for instance, feminist writers who came on board to fight a particular battle about feminism. And it turned out that they had to rethink a lot of other things to do that. Mm -hmm. And in that rethinking, they and and similarly, you know, with the it's the rethinking, ha having to sort out the rest in order to sort out one bit. When people do that, it takes them through those thoughts in a way that doesn't happen to an academic study of philosophy, where you're you're sort of thinking about what other philosophers have said. And reinterpreting that, rejigging it, you know. Um, it's when people actually start to engage with with the real world um, yeah. that that they start to come up with really fresh thoughts. How do we think about this aspect of the world now? And for me, that was very important with Rorty because the first book by him that I read was a great book called Contingency, Irony and Solidarity. Mm -hmm. And in that he talks at some length about 1984, the book 1984. Um, it was a big breakthrough to me to understand something that we were talking about right at the beginning, that empathy can be used to hurt people as well. Yes. Empathy isn't just this wonderful kind of balm that you cast onto people and everyone behaves better. People sometimes use their sense of empathy, that's to say their understanding of what's in somebody else's mind, to um, hurt them or to defeat them or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so that, that was very important. But the philosophers now that I'm reading, are in, a lot of the people who are writing books about the environment, 
yeah. and about how we should think about our relationship to the future. I'm reading a fantastic book at the moment, which I'm, I've got here, and I'm going to hold it up so that Good. the audience can see it. Have you heard of this? No, I haven't. No, I'll get it. It's, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing book. It's The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson. So he's, he's basically a um, – I'll hold it up again in case people want to write down the page. Um, I'm not paid to do this, by the way. <laughs> it's just such a thoughtful book. It's so full of ideas. Um, and one of the, really the ideas are about how do we value the future and what are we going to do about it? You know, the, we're currently destroying it at a fast rate. Um, do we really, do we really think that there aren't going to be consequences for this? Do we really not care about our grandchildren, for instance? Do we not think about the world that they're going to be in? Yeah. Um, so this book is a, it's a novel. It's a sci-fi novel, I guess you'd say, but really it's a work of philosophy, in my opinion. Um, mm. and you can't read it without thinking about those things that philosophers think about. Mm -hmm. You know, do we have, can we affect the future, for instance? Um, is, is there a moral position about affecting the future? How do we discount the future? And all these sorts of things. Yeah. I mean, that's a um, real thing. The, 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 the aversion, I mean, yeah, the discussion of Orwell in contingency, the idea of solidarity, I mean, the, the idea that what makes a liberal, as he would put it, is an aversion to cruelty. That's, it's as simple mm -hmm. as that. Yeah. Yes. The ironists, ironists about um, deep matters, we just don't know. And, and liberals, uh, in, a, a liberal just means someone who thinks cruelty is the worst thing that there is and it has to be avoided. We have to yes. be be nice, be nice, and don't be scared, as Dave Chappelle would say. And it's the, it's the, um, it's the, the philosophy, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, in, in, in the English speaking world has largely ended up as a kind of technically sharpened common sense. There's some very, mm -hmm. very clever people doing very, very, very little uh, in terms of, and, and, the, and, and that's the way you're taught to do things, because the, the other, the, the, the option I've always taken is just throwing shit at the wall and you know see just see what see what happens and then yeah uh, and some of it sticks and some of it runs down into little piles at the bottom of the, the wall and that's fine uh, and uh, but Rorty had also in that rarest of qualities which is uh, prose style he wrote incredibly well so he's someone yeah. that's been um, I mean, very much forgotten in uh, mainstream philosophy, and uh, and the kind of the pragmatism that he adopted is uh, has been forgotten too, which is a real pity because uh, it might just be right. I mean, the, the thinker that I feel very, a thinker that I feel very close to these days is uh, William James, and William James's um, late work, which is a similar, there's a sensibility which informs uh, Rorty very very deeply. But I guess yeah. what. We, I guess we've got at some point we've got. To, but I've got. I want to get this in, which is which is which That's is really. What I have to do, just I just interrupt you for a minute, because yeah. you know I don't have. I blew the fuses in this studio, so yeah, I don't no. have any power in here. So no, I. It's not getting dark. My computer is running out of power. But if I just walk across the garden here, <laughs> into another room, so so there'll be a brief scenic interlude where people can look at my. That's where I am. That's my little house. Okay, that's all your scenic interlude, and now we're going across to the across to the other house. Isn't oh, this it? It's nice little break. <laughs> There's the great. studio I'm sitting in. Um, okay, because then I can over here. I can plug in. You see, right. going through the kitchen. Going on a walk with you. Sorry, sorry about this, but I, otherwise I'm just going to suddenly cut out, and then that will be very rude. Okay, just let me get my. <laughs> That's great. Okay, there we are. Oh, now really? I'm, I'm back in action. <laughs> Looked uh, um, a little East Anglian out there, I must say. Yes, yes. Yeah, you you know East Anglia, don't you? I do. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. 
I miss it. I miss it very much. I miss the um, uh, I miss the the Suffolk coast. I miss um, places like Orford and uh, Alborough and um, mm. even Fort Ness and mm. strange. I love the kind of the the kind of raggedy, salty, you know, stubbly kind of bushes you get on the Suffolk coast and yeah, and, yeah. There's I, I miss that. I've not I've not seen it for a long time. Sorry, I, I, inter I interrupted you in, you were talking about Rorty and I interrupted no, I, you. I, I, I was going to, yeah, ask you a question, which is the, the uh, which is the following, which would be um, the relationship between, I mean, pragmatism, roughly, pragmatism and, and music, as, as you understand it, and thinking about that in relationship to, I think this will make. I hope this will make sense in, in relationship to the way you think about um, complexity theory. Mm -hmm. That the, and I hadn't really realised this until I was rereading it on Tuesday. That the complexity theory for you is that they're taking certain simple structures, say musical structures. You know what you, you know, what you've done for you, know, to, you know, from discrete music to forward to reflection, all those those simple structures, and then. And then allowing a kind of concatenation of simplicities to emerge yeah. into a new musical form, and that is not something that's not you know a thing in itself. Kind of metaphysics, you know, you're you're that's a pragmatic sensibility. It seems to me that what that yeah. composition. Yeah, it's it. Well, there are two reasons for it. One, I'm very attracted by economy, by the idea that you can make things that feel magical from very simple materials um, it does I'm not impressed when people make th complicated things from complicated materials it seems to me quite obvious that, <laughs> that that's what you'd get but but I am impressed when I see something where it's very easy to see the what's used for instance like a Mondrian painting yeah you know, a Mondrian picture is incredibly simple but for some reason it works it's very powerful to me anyway um, and ever since I was young I was fascinated by by that it seemed to me like the best kind of magic because that's what magic is you know the the conjurer shows you the cards and you you can see what's in his hand you know what a pack of cards is and something unexpected happens um, I always wanted that thrill from art that that so I always wanted it to be kind of obvious to a listener what was going on there's no sort of tricks there's no concealed bits it's this is all it is and yet for some reason it works and and the other thing of course is that i didn't have many other ways of making music available to me <laughs> you know i'm not a i'm not a player in the sense of i can't sit down at a piano and come up with a piece of music mm -hmm. um i i so the tools I developed are tools for somebody who can't do those things but can do something else. Um, but which turn out to be, you know, I don't know. Do I don't know. So I was going to say better tools because you know it's, um, you know, in a sense, the where are we with virtuoso musicianship? I think it's a it's. It's quite hard to tell. Um, th I was thinking when I was <clears throat> thinking about this over the last week, and I was stumbling back through things, and I was um, for some reason I went back to Gavin Bryars, um, yeah. Jesus, Jesus Blood. Yeah, know, uh, fantastic and, piece. Yeah, and just just how and the simplicity of that. There's nothing. You know, it's mm -hmm. obvious. The elements are, are completely obvious. What the elements are. Uh, there mm -hmm. are three and some recurring motifs, and so. Yeah, here it is, you know, and and yet it's able to. There is, there's magic there. There's something yeah. strange, and um, um, yes, and I find well, the it more, with me. I mean, with, more, with, uh, sorry. No, I was going to say, that, and that's. I mean, you know, the so if I look at the say the the flow chart, um, thinking back, I remember back to my you know vinyl copy of Discrete Music, which I bought. When it came out, um, and the flowchart on the back cover, you know, where you say this is what I did, 
It looks like that. it's like a cybernetics type diagram. Uh, yeah. And you think, well, okay, good. Uh, that's that's brilliant. I don't really understand that, but I, I see what you're doing. But it doesn't. Uh, but then the but the um, the magical quality of that, certainly for someone as a listener like me, I mean, why I would go back to that over and over again, not for not for reasons of familiarity, but for reasons of I don't know, some some felt something felt there, which is mm -hmm. so the system which generates this and the simplicity of that, and here are the elements, but then the effect, the emotional effect is something else, which I guess that's the magic, right? I saw something really nice in the supermarket the other day. Um, it was a, new, a new kind of biscuit, uh, sort of a cracker type thing called Fro, F-R-O. And they're really, they're really delicious. I, I tried them, they're really delicious. And the great thing is they put a recipe for how to make them yourself on the side of the packet. I thought that only Scandinavians would do that. They're from Denmark. I, think. I thought, what a brilliant thing to do to say, OK, these are great. You like them. You can make some yourself. That's so generous, isn't it? And it, it really made me a lifelong fan of that company. I, I'm going to live only on froze in the end because I thought, why doesn't everybody do that? Say, this is how you do it. Ministry for the Future and Froze, these are the two things I'm going to go out and buy immediately. I wonder if I can get, if I can get them here. We agree that we're, we're past our, we, yeah, we've got, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we better finish because I, 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 we should probably have dinner or lunch soon. But Yes. And um, thank you to the listeners and auditors and the people out there in, um, and I'm sorry we didn't get to your, a lot of your questions, but if you'd like to email me or whatever, just I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer them. And uh, thank you, Brian, really. Thank you, Simon. It was very nice to meet you, and I enjoyed having a chat with you. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye, everybody.